welcome, welcome to, to History Nuts. I'm Russ Carson Jr., the founder of Family Tree Nuts. At Family Tree Nuts, we build family trees for people and we produce videos at historic locations and videos that help to honor your ancestors. I'm Jameson Cable, founder of the Kentucky History Podcast, where we talk about anything Kentucky history, events, people, if it has to do with Kentucky, we're going to discuss it. And we've teamed up together to bring you History Nuts. History Nuts is a live show where we talk about, you guessed it, history. Right. History seems to be less and less to people today, but we are trying to do everything we can to keep it alive. Absolutely. History is a passion of ours for sure, but it connects to you. Russ, tell us about the best part of the show. You can join in. You can comment and ask questions live. We've got a great topic today, and we know you're going to enjoy this episode of History Nuts. And we are live. We are live to the shores we, of Tripoli. What's up, Jameson? Well, from, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. <laughs> Well, we, well right. yeah, but we, talk, <laughs> we we kind of talked about Montezuma, uh, Halls of Montezuma last week. But uh, <laughs> yeah, this time we're talking about the shores of Tripoli. Man, I am super, super excited about this particular show right here. Um, I think that this is something that a lot of people are not going to know very much about uh, or have never even heard of. But uh, to the Marine Corps, uh, this guy is a very, very important guy. He's one of the uh, top five guys that you might learn about, I guess, uh, in the Marine Corps. So uh, uh, who is Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon, and why are we talking about him on History Nuts? Well, he's got a big connection, and you stole one of my questions. I was going to ask you, you – you're a Marine as well, right? So I was going to ask you a question. Well, I'll, I'll save it for a little later, but you, you kind of you kind of got into it there a little bit. But very important dude. Uh, a lot of uh, military accomplishments, um, a connection to Kentucky as well. So he's worth, worthy of talking about, right? Definitely, without a shadow of a doubt. And uh, so make sure you guys uh, – hey, I see Greg's watching there, Semper Fi, brother. But uh, I, I, um, make sure you guys chime in. Um, tell us where you're watching from. Uh, ask us questions. That's part of the show. Uh, last few shows we've done, we haven't had a lot of uh, – uh, questions and things like that or input so uh, if we could get some input from you guys that makes our job a little bit easier and uh, also we should hit we should also uh, subscribe somewhere shouldn't we I subscribe to family Tree nuts YouTube channel subscribe to the Kentucky history channel uh, like the Facebook pages and all that good stuff but yes absolutely these, uh, yeah yeah, yeah. these these those that we're doing right now are searchable and they're right there on our YouTube channel forever. Uh, we have a playlist on there for uh, history nuts. So you could go back and watch the show or listen to it six months later from now or whenever. So, but uh, are you ready to get so, started talking about? Oh, Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon, right? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Where, where, where does, uh, where did, uh, Oh, Lieutenant O'Bannon get his start from? Where'd he come from? Well, he was born in uh, Farquhar County there in Virginia and uh, mm -hmm. born in, uh, do you know what year he was born? Uh, 1776. Of course. What other year would he be born <laughs> in, man? 1776, of course, <laughs> was when he was born. And uh, he grew up uh, just about a mile or so west of uh, present day Marshall, Virginia. And uh, mm -hmm. did, he grew up in a pretty... Uh, Kind of hand to mouth poor family, didn't he? Well, uh, I mean, his father was in the Revolutionary War, right? I mean, yeah. Uh, his his uh, mother was Anne Neville, sister yeah. of General John Neville. Now, do you know anything about John Neville? Yeah, he actually was the uh, commander at uh, Fort Pitt uh, during the Revolution there, that uh, of course became the town of uh, Pittsburgh. And, uh, so that, and that's actually uh, Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon's middle name, Presley Neville O'Bannon. Neville, Neville. You don't hear a lot of Nevilles these days. Just maybe no. from Harry Potter, but <laughs> Harry Potter. Is there a Neville on there? 
Yeah, you gotta you gotta catch up on your Harry Potter, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. But uh, yes, yeah, so he doesn't grow up a poor kid. He grew up. He's connected. Mm -hmm. He's landed. Uh, uh, they're not incredibly wealthy, but landed. They said his father was a captain in the in the in the Revolutionary War. His uh, grandfather, no, his uncle, was mm -hmm. uh, commander of Fort Pitt. And uh, so, Marquis de Lafayette. What's the connection? Well, his cousin he's named after his cousin <laughs> his mother's brother's son uh was named presley neville who was the um what's it uh aid aid de camp to mark you yeah. yet is yeah, that man is, is aid de camp or aid de comp Am I saying that either right? way either okay. way it depends on if you want to be french or not so aid de camp. <laughs> but uh de yeah camp. Yeah, so he's got a lot of connections, and this isn't the, the end of his connections, of course, but uh, mm -hmm. definitely uh, it, it got some people that uh, are movers and shakers. Um, his, I think his dad was originally from Ireland, uh, hence the O'Bannon, which is another interesting thing. Mm -hmm. They originally immigrated to Maryland, where the majority of the Irish Catholics came from, as did my great, 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 great seventh great grandfather, mm -hmm. um, become, they came from Ireland. Um, and, uh, as a young man, he had an interesting early job. Uh, yeah. So he was the deputy sheriff. I mean, yeah, <laughs> that's pretty interesting. <laughs> well, deputy sheriff is a little bit different back in that, that time. You know, the sheriff was an incredibly important position. Not that it's not now. But uh, very political uh, office there for you know to enforcing the laws and the communities there. So as a deputy sheriff, it was a pretty important job when he was a very young man there. Uh, Don says hello all from Arton, Ohio, and I see Stephanie's watching. Denise, Darla, um, Greg, Josh, let us know where you're watching from, folks. And uh, so he joined the Marine Corps at an early age. Yeah. Um, uh, before before you get that, because we're about to say the year he joined the Marine Corps, which is eighteen oh one. When when did the Marine Corps start? Uh, I, was, this, oh, I, no, I assume no, you know this. I have no idea. I don't know. You don't know? Back in seventeen seventy five, my Marine Corps came alive, man. Ten November seventeen seventy five in Tun Tavern <laughs> there in Philadelphia. We were born in a bar, man. Born in a bar. Born in the bar. <laughs> yeah, man. Born in the bar. Congress uh, passed a, it passed in to raise up of uh, two units of Marines, and uh, mm -hmm. th this is some. I'm, I'm guessing that the people that are going to be watching this over amount of, a long amount of time are Marines. People are going to be searching for this. Um, a lot of Marines have uh, watched some other stuff we've done on Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon, but. Mm -hmm. I'm jumping a little bit ahead of myself. We're, we're, I'm going to go ahead and say this though: is what is the Marine Corps? What what mm -hmm. uh, is the difference? Because I think a lot of people don't understand. You know, you got Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. What is a Marine? Do you know? Um, not necessarily. I was going to say, like, what's it? Uh, is it a Navy SEAL that's sea, air, something, land? Yeah, yeah. That's not a marine, yeah. though. So I don't know. The air and land, yeah, and it's a little bit different animal there. Uh, the seals are, <laughs> for sure. Uh, special That's, unit. But so, so the, marine, yeah. What, what, what's what's? Uh, uh, just go ahead. I, I, I don't. I'm not probably sounding foolish. So you go ahead. Well, what what a marine is is just what it sounds like. Is a, a marine? You think of the ocean. You think it's a soldier mm -hmm. of the sea. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that the Marine Corps is part of the Navy. It is the Department okay. of the Navy. Um, there is no uh, Marine Corps Academy like there is a Naval Academy or Air Force Academy in West Point. Um, the Marines come out of the Naval Academy. They're very much part of the Navy. And the purpose of the Marine Corps traditionally was to be a, a shock force, um, you know, the uh, first in, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Navy Navy would pull up, bring everybody there. They'd offload their Marines onto the uh, shore to gain a foothold on shore. Mm -hmm. 
let the army fight the war. The Marines weren't originally designed to, um, to fight the wars per se. They were designed to come in and kick tail, get some ground to uh, bring the bring the army in to fight the rest of the war. And that's why Marines today are a force of readiness, of expeditious, uh, expeditionary force that uh, can be anywhere in the globe to do whatever the mission takes within 48 hours. Um, that's a whole nother subject there. I know we're not here to talk about the Marines so much. I can talk all night long about that, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing the Marines were known to do on the ships is they were known for their marksmanship, as they are today. Uh, they used to be up in the ship's riggings, and uh, they were sharpshooters up in the top, you know, by the crow's nest and stuff to uh, pick people off when the two ships come together mm -hmm. and battle. So uh, that is so what a Marine is. So I'm going to throw this out, and, and people may already know this, but I'll ask it anyway, just in case people don't. D-Day, or those Marines that invaded on the shores of Normandy? No? No, absolutely not. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was the Army. <laughs> but, uh, the, the Marines were uh, otherwise occupied in the uh, Pacific Theater. Uh, all gotcha. The, uh, well, that would, that would make, that'd make more sense, because there was a lot of uh, different islands they was going to. So, okay. Right. Yeah. Right. The, uh, you know, we'd like to claim that one, but uh, that was that was the army. They did something right one time at least. But uh, <laughs> so, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Got a lot of army. Uh, so, well, we got yeah, we got a little off topic, but we're on topic. Yeah, a little yeah, off topic. Sure did there. <laughs> I love so, the when, so, so uh, O'Bannon, he joined he joined the Marine Corps. How, how old was he? That was the question you asked me. He was about 25 years old. Joined in uh, okay. 1801. Mm -hmm. And came in as, I think, February of 1801. Uh, he was a second lieutenant. And uh, by October, he promoted him to uh, first lieutenant, um, which is the rank that uh, he stayed at. And uh, he got a lot of, like other, like other Marines, he got sent all over the daggone place. Yeah, served uh, quite a few different places. Um, served on the USS Adams. Um, went to the Med, Mediterranean. Yeah. Yeah, the most Marines are constantly, they, they have, uh, they constantly have a Marine unit uh, called a MU, Marine Expeditionary Unit, in the Mediterranean at all times. They have two of them out there at all times. But it's funny that uh, even clear back then, 220 years ago, guys were uh, um, getting sent to the mid. <laughs> um and uh, so, yeah, so we, going all over the place. Um, he also um, was assigned to the Marine Barracks in Washington, D.C. in 1803. Yeah, yeah when he and, came well, back. Go ahead. I was going to say, you know, we talked about uh, Zachary Taylor, who moved all over the country uh, when he was um, in, in the Army. But it looks like uh, um, O'Bannon here is really moving all over the, the sea, all over the ocean, everywhere. Uh, yeah, man, the, the, the Navy and the uh, Marines are known for uh, traveling quite a bit, uh, you know, for sure. And he's, he was stationed there in Marine Barracks. That's at 8th and I. Um, here's a little side note. Uh, during the War of 1812, when the British burned the Capitol there in D.C., one of the very few buildings that they did not burn was the Marine Barracks uh, there. Uh, so uh, it was out of respect um, for the Marines, that, the Marines and what they do. Um, at 18, in November of 1803, he was assigned to the Marine Barracks. In 1804, he was assigned to the uh, USS President, and he got sent. Sent away? <laughs> sent back to the Med again. They sent, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they sent him back to the Med for his second tour out there on the Mediterranean. Yeah. And uh, then he was transferred again to the USS Constitution, the famous ship that uh, mm -hmm. you know many people mm -hmm. know about, the USS Constitution. And finally, he was assigned to the USS Argus. There you go, USS Argus. Um, any idea of what, what that's named after? That one I don't know. No. We'll have to check that out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so he commanded uh seven marines and two midshipmen under general yep. william eaton's army in the the durin or well well general uh e he's previously an army general but uh, he was basically an mm -hmm. emissary uh, sent for negotiations uh eaton and uh while they were out on the med they uh, got sent on a uh, a pretty uh 
a pretty high profile mission. Um, they mm -hmm. first landed in Egypt, of course. Um, the uh, well, I'm getting ahead of myself too. There, the whole reason they're, they're they're over there was because of the daggone Barbary pirates. Who are the Barbary, Barbary pirates? pirates? That's a good question. I, I, I when I when I hear Barbar, Barbary pirates, I think of uh, barbarians, you know, or pirates. You know, are they coming together here, or what exactly? Well, yeah, it was. I think the but the Barbary. They came from the Barbary Coast, which is mm -hmm. North Africa. I think it was yeah. the city states of Morocco, Tunis, uh, Tripoli, and uh, there's one more um, of the uh, uh, the city states there on the Barbary Coast. Mm -hmm. But those city states, their rulers sponsored piracy out on the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. and were constantly seizing merchant ships, stealing their goods and uh, pressing the, uh, their, their sailors into service and also making slaves out of them and mm -hmm. uh, for ransom. Most of the uh, countries in Europe just got used to it. This went on for decades. They just kind of so paid that, off. Yeah, that uh, definitely causes um, problems for, well, I guess if you want to call it uh, nations or uh, states that are actually trying to do goods and businesses. Um, so that can be an issue. I mean, I, I don't want to necessarily say these Barbary pirates are like terrorists or anything, but I mean, that might be a good way to say they yeah. were kind of terrorizing the sea. Absolutely. They were, you know, kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, you know, stealing that and, and basically a nuisance. And it was just easier to just pay these guys and uh, get on with it. Uh, I think mm -hmm. France even had it as part of their annual budget. Uh, to pay to pay tribute to these guys, <laughs> uh, you know, France is always, you know, you know, they're they're not known. For yeah. <laughs> uh, for aggression, I guess. But, um, anyway, um, no uh, offense Thomas, to our French what? viewers. Do what? I said no offense to our French viewers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I don't think we're going to find uh, too many people that will disagree with us there. But uh, yeah. Thomas Jefferson, before he was president, was sent as an emissary to London to meet with a representative of these uh, of the Barbary Coast, mm -hmm. and uh, said hey, he told him, "Hey, man, you know, why don't you stop uh, attacking us?" <laughs> And, uh, I mean, lay off us, man. Lay, lay off us, brother. Come on, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, and, and, and they said, okay, man, we'll leave the Americans alone, didn't they? No, no. It didn't work that easy. It was not that easy. <laughs> yeah, that, so their, their reply was, it, or his reply was, it is in the Quran to steal from the infidel and to mm -hmm. kill the infidel mm -hmm. and to make the infidel their slaves. So that was pretty cut and dry. Yeah, that didn't, uh, that didn't uh, go over too well. <laughs> There's still some people that believe this, and we're, we're, so we're still mm -hmm. having this, this issue at times, aren't we? Um, Very much so. <laughs> yeah, so shortly thereafter, Thomas Jefferson becomes president, and he... Uh, petitions Congress and says, hey, we've got to do something about these pirates. This is costing us our Americans' lives. And mm -hmm. I know at this point in time, some guys had been in slavery for over a decade uh, to the wow. Barbary pirates, really Americans. I mean, think about yeah. that. I mean, I mean and I, I've, I've read one time that uh, there was more Europeans that were pressed into slavery from the Barbary pirates then there were African slaves that entered into the United States. Wow. So to put that into perspective. Um, now, I'm, people don't realize that there was only, and, and I'm ignorant, I'm not, this is not an exact number here. Um, I can't remember, it's like 4 million um, or 40, I, can't, I, I don't even want to pretend to know, but it's a very small amount of the slaves that actually entered into the United States. But uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm getting off topic there again, but. Um, <laughs> Basically, Thomas Jefferson uh, petitioned Congress, and they rose up uh, a few ships to uh, with the to go on the mission to uh, stamp mm -hmm. out the Barbary pirates. And the old Bannon is selected to take part uh, in in the special mission, uh, yeah. and this kind of makes him famous. I mean, this is what he's known for. This is the big deal. 
It is. It is. Uh, they originally uh, land in Egypt. Mm -hmm. They're at Alexandria, and um, previous General Eaton actually raises a U.S. flag over foreign soil. He's the first person to raise a U.S. flag over foreign soil. But, but it, wasn't, it wasn't wartime. So, <laughs> um, uh. They did. They take a trip up the Nile River, which would be really cool. And uh, I've been at the very, very, well, very beginning of the Nile. Well, you moment. know, just thinking about Egypt and stuff like that, I, I just don't, it's hard to picture these colonial era, you know, 1800 ships going to Egypt. I just want to picture pharaohs and pyramids and that sort of thing. <laughs> it's hard to kind of put it together that this was going on sure. but especially with their clothes that they wore back then you know with those they wore those hats that pointed down you know and in, in the front and the back and uh, <laughs> yeah. those heavy coats and things like that so and they actually fought like that uh hey by, by the way since that if you saw the thumbnail picture of uh, lieutenant presley o'bannon it's during this time that uh uh the, the uniform and stuff marines had those great big uh collars on you know oh uh, yeah things. Have you ever heard a marine called, called, the leather, called Leatherneck? Oh, okay. Is that is that where it's from? The where that came from? They wear that that leather collar for you know to help protect uh, sword blows to the neck right there. Oh, huh. well, and another go, man. learning, learning. Yeah, <laughs> they were veering off of O'Bannon a little bit, but uh, <laughs> we're moving right along through the story. But um, it's at that time while they're in Egypt that they uh, meet a guy, Prince Hammett. And uh, mm -hmm. he's got a long, much longer other name there, but uh, uh, an Arabic name. And Prince Hammett was originally in the rightful ruler of Tripoli, but was ostracized mm -hmm. by these pirates. And he says, hey, man, why don't we team up? If you guys are wanting to oust them, let's team up together. Let's do this. Get my, get my throne back. Help you guys out. Sounds like a treaty or a deal. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so... Uh, they team up together, and yep. uh, so basically Prince Hammett's men, Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon and his uh, seven Marines and uh, three midshipmen. That, I mean, is that, I mean, you're talking about 10 people? Yes. Wow, that, that's quite amazing. But we're tracking across the desert. I mean, you, you know, that's amazing in well, its own, but we're talking about 600 miles across the desert. Yeah. Well, and they, they also teamed up with about 500 mercenaries of uh, okay. Arabic and, and Greek mercenaries <laughs> that were hired. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you don't forget those guys. Yeah, but, that, makes it a, that makes it a little bit more doable, right? <laughs> right. So they, they trek across the Sahara there, 600 miles, like you said, with about 100 camels, you know, kind of thing. What a, what a horrible, horrible uh, trip. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Man, that's different. Right. Uh, oh, so ta we're talking about different kind, of, different war setting, I guess, is what I'm trying to get at. You know, you think about, you know, over here in North America, you got forest and this and that, but this is this is desert. It's a different di different environment. And this is a wild time. This is a time, and I'd be willing to say that if you pulled 100 Americans, how many of them would know about the Barbary Pirates War? And if they're not a Marine, chances are yeah. they probably do not know that <laughs> what yeah. that is. Yeah. Then between the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812. Uh, America's in its infancy and uh, trying to spread its wings. And right from the beginning, we didn't negotiate with terrorists. Hey, we want to go out there and uh, you know, <laughs> cut the snake of the head off, or the head of the snake off there. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So they get to, yeah. they, they, on, on the way, they arrive at D Derna. Am I saying that correctly? Derna? Yeah, at Derna. And uh, be yeah. before we go any further, why don't we, why don't we break there? Okay. Uh, we'll take a quick commercial because – um, we, we, we're uh, more than halfway through the story there of Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon. Now, bear with us, folks. This is an 11-minute video. Um, this was uh, filmed yesterday. I'm actually at the grave of Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon, and there are some other things that are around there. And we're, so some of this stuff will be a spoiler for the rest of the, what we're going to talk about tonight, but I don't talk a whole lot about him, but I want you to see where he is and some other things that are around there. So uh, um, oh, stay with us. Yeah. And it looks like we are live. 
Hey, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. I know you know that song. I know you know that song. Hey, everybody, this is Colonel Carson with Family Tree Nuts. And I'm at the graveside of a, uh, a famous American, a famous Kentuckian, and a very famous Marine. I'm at the graveside of uh, Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon. Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon. Um, the reason why this video is a little bit different than what we normally do at Family Tree Nuts, I'm not going to tell you a ton about Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon today. This is a preview of tomorrow night's show. Uh, we, we team up with uh, uh, Jamison Cable from the Kentucky History Podcast, and usually, usually on Thursday nights at 9 p.m., Eastern time, we do a live show discussing a different person in Kentucky or U.S. history. Um, this week is about Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon. So we're going to be talking about him tomorrow night instead. Tomorrow night shows on Wednesday, not Thursday. Uh, we've got some stuff going on on Thursday that we can't do it. But 9 p.m. Eastern time, we're going to talk about this man. But I wanted to do a preview to that to take you to his gravesite. I'm in Frankfort, Kentucky. I'm in Frankfort Cemetery, uh, just up the hill from the Capitol. Right through them trees right there is the grave of uh, Daniel Boone. You know Daniel Boone, but who's Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon? Uh, who is he? Like I said, I'm not going to go in great detail on Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon today because we're going to check it out on the live show, but uh, Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon is the first American to ever plant the U.S. flag on foreign soil. Now, this was during the Barbary Pirates War. What's the Barbary Pirates War? We're going to go in detail on that tomorrow at the show. But the Barbary Pirates War basically was a band of pirates that were attacking U.S. and everybody else's merchant ships on the Mediterranean. For decades, most company, or countries just paid them off in tribute uh, so they can move their, their goods. The United States does not negotiate with terrorists right from the beginning. So uh, Thomas Jefferson was sent as an emissary to negotiate, hey, stop robbing our ships, man. And uh, he was basically told that, uh, hey, it says in the Koran that it's okay to kill infidels and make them your slaves. So uh, a lot of people don't realize that tremendous amount of uh, Americans were pressed into service into slavery during this time. So make a very, very long story short, some ships were raised up and uh, a small unit of Marines were sent to North Africa to battle the Barbary pirates. We're going to go in detail on that tomorrow. In uh, 1806, spring of 1806, Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon attacks the city of Derna and is successful. And basically, a long story short there, uh, the battle um, very near the, uh, the uh, city of Tripoli, um, they replace uh, Prince Hammett in charge of his country. Now, he had a sword that he carried with him called a Mameluke sword. That sword was given to Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon for establishing him um, as the... Uh, hey, we got some folks. Hey, how you doing? So, we're doing a live show or a live video here. How you doing? So, yeah, man. So uh, now that sword was given... Um, Prince Hammett gave his sword to Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon as a... Uh, uh, appreciation for his toughness of, of throwing out the pirates and establishing his command back. Um, <clears throat> that sword was carried by Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon in 1825. The grand old man of the Marine Corps, uh, Archibald Henderson, made it the official sword. A Stephen says, uh, Semper Fi, Semper Fi, brother, made it the official sword of the Marine Corps officers. The oldest uh, weapon still used by the U.S. arsenal. I know some people are going to argue with me on that. But uh, the Mameluke sword was given. You've seen it, all the different commercials. You've seen those Marine officers carrying that sword. That's the Mameluke sword that was given to Lute Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon. He's buried right here. You see the historic markers right there. I know it's backwards. We'll show this during the live show. Um, we've also got his grave right here. I'm going to read this for you. Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon. Um, departed this life on September 12th, 1850, age 74 years, the hero of Derna, Tripoli, Northern Africa, uh, April 27th, 1805, captain of the United States Marines, was the first to plant the American flag on foreign soil. That's actually not totally correct. Um, general, uh, uh, the prior general that was with them, Eaton, actually planted the flag uh, over Egypt, uh, but it right before this in the same campaign, but that was not during wartime. So 
major person in a uh, American history, major person to all Marines. But uh, we're actually at Kentucky State Mound, and, and I wanted to show you um, what this is real quick. And I'm going to go real fast through this because this is not the video. Good morning from Alabama, Alice says. I see you there. It's, it was founded here in 1847. Now, that was right during the uh, Spanish-American War. If you saw our show about Zachary Taylor, you know that Zachary Taylor was uh, a hero of the Mexican-American War. Um, and, and there's several people that are, that are buried here. Uh, we've got uh, Philip Barber, who actually uh, um, <clears throat> died in 1847, I think in the Battle of uh, Monterey. And I'm going to run up here real quick. You see the monument that's behind me right there. I just want you to see what's, what's here. We'll come back and do a much better video at this place. Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon's grave is right here. We're going to head up here. And you know this, was, uh, this monument here was erected in 1850. But the purpose of this was the Kentucky State Mound was to be a resting place of prominent uh, Kentuckians that uh, either died or, or were major people in service to their country. Somebody of note, right over my shoulder here, Henry Clay Jr. Henry Clay Jr. is buried right there, uh, died there to battle Buena Vista. Um, Gary Fry. Um, C.N. Cardwell, a lot of these guys, uh, W.R. McGee died at that battle of Buena Vista there where uh, we know uh, Zachary Taylor led them in there. Colonel Hardin, his name's right there on the side. There's many other uh, headstones that surround it, but it's flanked by some major headstones that are there. Um, W.T. Willis, C.M. Vaughn. Um, but I wanted to take you back here too. Like I said, this is not the story, but since we're here, you might as well check it out. Right here is the gravesite of Theodore O'Hara. If you don't know who Theodore O'Hara is, well, that's the monument there. His gravesite is right here. He is the author of that famous poem, The Bivouac of the Dead. He's buried there too. Then we've got different plaques and such that are around here talking about uh, Kentuckians' uh, involvements in all the different American wars. A lot of names are listed on there and such too. Um, wanted to take you back here. One more quick thing. I'm gonna run. It's hot. I'm not that out of shape, <laughs> but uh, when you're talking fast and uh, out here in this heat and moving at the same time, wanted to take you to the grave of this guy because we've talked about him before. <clears throat> Richard Mentor. Um, <clears throat> Johnson, Richard Mentor Johnson, which was Martin Van Buren's, President Martin Van Buren's vice president. Um, his grave is right here. Um, he was a Kentucky politician. Um, many say that uh, he uh, killed Tecumseh. He's one of the, the people that's reputed, or reported to have killed Tecumseh. Um, we know that William Whitley, his family would have something to say about that. But uh, notice that statue right there. Man on a horse, shooting a uh, Native American warrior, but he's missing his head. Don't know the story on that. Before we come back and do a full video, we're going to find out the story there. His gravesite is right here as well. So here we are at this, uh, um, <clears throat> the, 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 the place here in Frankfurt Cemetery that honors Tremendous amount of, of prominent Kentucky uh, war veterans, especially from mid-19th uh, mid century, mid-1800s. Oh, I forgot to talk about the monument back there. It does have many prominent people that died at, at battles leading up to that, turn, that time period right there. Battle of Blue Licks is on there. I'm going to walk up close so you can see it. All right, I'm a hurrying. You even see Estel's defeat is on there as well. I've got some photographs I'll post so you'll be able to see that. But uh, um, Colonel John Todd, people that uh, died in, in these famous battles in Kentucky history and uh, about a little bighorns on here, Indian Wars and such like that is on there as well. Like I said, this is not the video. This is not the video. I wanted to just be able to take you to uh, Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon's grave because tomorrow... Tomorrow at 9 p.m. Eastern, myself and Jameson Cable of the Kentucky History Podcast are going to be uh, doing our live show where we will go into the great detail about uh, this famous Marine, Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon. Oh, he, what's his connection to Kentucky? 
born in Virginia. After the war, he moves to Kentucky, inherited some land, moved to Logan County, became a politician, um, was a state representative, um, <clears throat> moved, uh, um, actually moved into uh, Spencer County, I think, no, Shelby County, I think, out here, and uh, where he eventually passed away, and of course, and he's buried here. Huge American during his time. I mean, this would have been an absolute rock star. The first American to plant the U.S. flag over, over foreign soil. And in his lifetime, the Commandant of the Marine Corps passes in, passes into law or, or make, makes a decree that every Marine officer will then carry the Mamluk sword or replica thereof. So anyway, wanted to take you to this great site. Check out the show tomorrow. We'll go in great deal about uh, Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon, one of the greatest Marines ever to live. So uh, we'll take off for now. Hey, Semper Fi. And remember, family tree nuts. Let our nuts find the nuts in your family tree. And we're there back. We we're back. That oh, was a little bit of a long one there, wasn't it? Hey, I appreciate the information, but I also appreciate the hustle. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to hustle because it gets boring if you're just walking and talking, you know. So Yeah, well, and it, uh, I, it was hot that day. It was very hot. So. Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely, for sure. So, yeah, you can see there that's where uh, Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon is buried right there. Um when I moved here, I could not believe I was looking at I actually saw the historic marker with the big Eagle, Eagle Globe and Anchor, the uh, Marine emblem there on it. I'm like, what is this? And I, what the heck? Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon is buried in Frankfurt? What the heck for? You know, kind of thing. So uh, when I found that about 20 years ago. So uh, it's one of those cool little things that uh, people in Kentucky should be pretty proud of that uh, he's there. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know nothing about him until until you brought him up as well, and then you know finding out he, he had a I mean pretty legit connection to Kentucky, which we'll, we'll get into a little bit later. Um, yeah, right we got now. a couple, couple comments oh, there no. too. Uh, Brian Taylor said, uh, "Semper Fi, Semper Fi, brother," and uh, Don said, "Great video." Um, Greg says the original sword has been lost for two centuries. We're not there yet, Greg. Hang on, brother. We're going to get to that <laughs> <laughs> thing. So. Uh, um, Greg Hayden says Semper Fi is 20 miles from Camp Lejeune. Spent uh, about five years of my life there. And uh, Semper Fi, man. Um, Alex says that uh, he's watching from Independence, Kentucky, Kenton County. Would love to see a video on George Rogers Clark and his men traveling throughout Ohio River Valley and possibly the Little Miami watershed. We definitely plan on doing some videos uh, on that this yeah. summer. And uh, Betty says she's watching from Michigan. So uh, good Michigan. deal. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks. Uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. Um, so, uh, O'Bannon is tracking through the desert to uh, 600 miles, right? Yeah. 600 miles uh, to Derna. And what happens yeah. next? Well, they first they send them, uh, they say, hey, you know, we're going to give you a chance for peace and uh, mm -hmm. ask them if they would like to go ahead and surrender. And they had an interesting comeback. Oh, the, uh, yeah, the, the reply was uh, quite um, telling. Uh, my head or yours? My head or yours. I thought that was a pretty good uh, reply. Pretty simple. Didn't mince words very much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was my head or yours. Um, so, so April 27th, 1805, began the uh, siege there on Derna. And, uh, huh? He, I, I said he leads the attack, which is yeah, leads the attack there. Uh, notice this is the shores of Tripoli. So if you you know people hear that song from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, the Marines' hymn. Uh, first two, li second line there is uh, comes down to this uh, this little this I don't want to say little this battle right here, um, and uh, the the USS Nautilus, the Argus, and the Hornet arrived in the harbor and started to shell the city. O'Bannon and his men dodge bullets, go to it, get atop the ramparts where the cannon are sitting, turn the cannon around on the city and blast the heck out of it. And uh, uh, after about another two hours of hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat uh, in the city, the city was theirs. Um, they took the city. And this is on what we would call like modern day Lydia. That's kind of, that's the area. Yes, um, and right uh, very near the, uh, the the city of Tripoli, which is still there. 
mm-hmm. uh, today, uh, today. Yeah, I was talking with a guy this week that was actually from Tripoli, but uh, oh, cool. right there on the coast. Um, Tripoli did rally and sent uh, some troops to, to try to re, re-attack uh, and take the city back, but uh, a bayonet charge led, charge led by the Marines uh, totally repelled it, and the city was theirs for good. So uh, I always like a bayonet charge, you know? <laughs> you, you honestly imagine them these days, but... <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's, uh, that's last resort, but uh, that's some pretty physical stuff there. Um, so they raise the flag over, uh, the over flag. Donut, and O'Bannon and that, becomes, O'Bannon becomes the first man or woman or person to raise the American flag over foreign soil during wartime. So that's pretty cool. Um, that's a, it, it, it's, you say that, but that's, that's pretty cool. Um, first person to raise the American flag over foreign soil during wartime. Um, we used to have a saying, I said, if I'm standing on it, it's America. So, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, not very politically correct in today's world, but, uh, you know, in the Marines, we weren't very politically correct. So <laughs> but, uh, anyway, another subject. Um, yeah. the, so the story of, um, uh, the, the events here is, um, you know, I, I said been sung about for, for many years in the, um, you know, Marines and uh, elsewhere, but um, uh, they made songs. You know, about it. It, was, it was such a big deal. They stayed in the 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 story of that stayed around for for a few generations. They would sing about the heroic deeds that happened that day. So let, let's talk about the sword, sword though. You know, the, what, the what, man, what was that man? song? What was that song though? Do you do you know the Arabic? <laughs> <laughs> I, I do enough uh trying to do french and i'm pretty bad at english as well so <laughs> well, the, the, the verses know. that they said was din din muhammad you rias maleka mohalandi which means muhammad for religion american for stubbornness so uh, <laughs> i thought that was pretty cool so uh, the, the, the american for stubbornness there's some Definitely some truth to that. <laughs> daggone right. Yeah, man. We're the ones that uh, put an end to this daggone Barbary pirates attacking. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, the sword. Prince, Prince, Prince Hammett. Right. Hammett. Uh, Karamanali. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I've always known uh, yeah, Prince Hammett. He, he was um, restored to as the ruler of Tripoli. And uh, he was so grateful uh, that uh, of, of O'Bannon and the troops that he presented O'Bannon with his jeweled mama, or Mameluke sword. Mameluke sword, uh, yes. His own personal sword that uh, he had carried there uh, while he was in Egypt. And that sword, the, the Mameluke swords had been used by the Mameluke uh, warriors uh, from about the 1200s uh, through the 1500s and then beyond. Uh, um, but, uh, it, it, it's a little different. It had, you know, that Arab curve, you know, to it, uh, you might yeah. think of a little sickle to it, uh, the original one, but he gave his sword to O'Bannon. So that's a, that's quite a, uh, he's, he's a pretty happy guy. Yeah. Yeah. That's a pretty nice gesture for sure. Um, O'Bannon is a hero. He uh, comes back to Philly, gets a big, uh, welcome, uh, uh given a golden saddle. And yeah. a white satin embroidered cover for his uh, Arabian horse that he brought, yeah. he brought back. So that's yeah, pretty brought, cool. Brought back his own horse. Yeah, man. And the city of Philadelphia was, no, Virginia gave him a uh, another Mameluk sword that uh, has a, 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 logo, a label on there uh, with, a, a, with Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon standing there with, sword in one hand and the American flag in the other uh, on there. And uh, um, they say that uh, those were lost. Um, the, the golden saddle, the satin cover, uh, his original sword yeah. lost, lost to time kind of thing. So, wow. That, um, um, that's a bummer. Yeah. So, cool, he gets out of the Marines there in 1807 
and uh, his he he married a lady. Um, I forget his wife's name, but uh, he married a lady. But her 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 father. Uh, was an American general and fought at the Battle of Calpins. And uh, actually, uh, when he died, he gave a bunch of land that he had in Kentucky to uh, mm -hmm. Lieutenant President O'Bannon and his wife. So they moved. Bring them to Kentucky. Yeah, man. That's better. <laughs> moved them to Logan County, Kentucky, uh, where they lived mm -hmm. out there in Russellville. His house is still uh, still there. You can visit it, his house there. And uh, he, he got into uh, a certain kind of business. Real estate, real estate man. Selling that, sell that land. Became a real estate agent. And, <laughs> yeah, man, making, making his money kind of like, uh, uh, hey, man, but real estate is where it's at in a lot of cases. But uh, and then he became a politician. Ah, a good old politician. Yep. So he served at uh, the Kentucky State. Uh, legislator, 1812, 1817, 1820 to 21, and then in the state uh, Senate from 24 to 26. So a pretty substantial military career as well. And, you know, I, 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 reception, I'm, I'm so surprised that he does, that there's not a county, uh, a, a, an O'Bannon County or just a Bannon County in Kentucky, because he kind of meets a lot of the criteria that was <laughs> – that a lot of these counties are named after. So, yeah. And, uh, and for his notoriety, I mean, you know, he, I mean, pretty popular dude, I would assume, especially for his uh, victories there uh, and to have the sword and all this stuff. It seemed like, why wasn't he given a county name? But I guess he just, and he's a politician. I mean, come on, he's, he met all, he meets all the criteria. So. Yeah, I'm not sure. I guess that's the time they were naming things and stuff. Uh, you know, they had shortly there after his being a politician, we entered into the Mexican American war there. And a lot of counties were made, you know, from people there. But uh, while he's serving as legislature in Kentucky, um, and this is one of the things he's most known for in the Marine Corps, for sure, and something that existed to this day. In 1825, a commandant, Archibald Henderson, the grand old man of the Marine Corps for his long service to the Marine Corps, makes it to where all Marine Corps officers carry a manulic sword or a replica of that. Um, I've got one back here with me right here. You see that the manulic has a, you know, the pearl handle yeah. system, the acorns, hilts there. Um, you know, it doesn't have the original curvature of the uh, original manulic sword, but this is the one when you see the Marine commercials or uh, you see a Marine around, uh, this is the sword that they carry to this day, uh, the manulic sword. So um, that's, pretty big legacy right there from a man mm -hmm. um, to carry up that battle that, that uh, basically gave the Marines uh, a real name for themselves. And uh, the Marines have constantly had to prove uh, that there was a reason for their existence. Um, yeah. And each of these are battles and, uh, or wars that we get into. So uh, definitely something to be proud of there. I agree. Uh, very cool. Uh, well, that, that brings me to my uh, connection or my question for you, Russ. I mean, how, how big is your connection or do you feel a big connection to this guy? I mean, is he high up on the list of military, I guess, former military people uh, being a Marine? How, I mean, how's your connection to that? Well, or to him? Marine, Marines are tremendously huge into history, you know, kind of thing. Uh, it's a huge part of even a boot camp for, for your Marine is your Marine Corps history. Uh, the Marine Corps is kind of like a cult. It's a really, you know, kind of thing. It's a really, really small organization. And uh, you really do. If you stay in long enough, you start running into people you already know. So it's a real small organization, but they're tremendously big on their history. And Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon, like I said, is one of those top five guys um, that uh, you hear about and know about uh, um, that was was a hero. And uh, right there from yeah. the beginning. You know, yeah, absolutely. A uh, very important person to the Marines, which is why I wanted to do this story right there, even though that a lot of people that don't know anything about the Marine Corps would have known anything about Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon. So, yeah. 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 Well, so back to the story. Um, his wife, Matilda, and uh, we're, you know, 1832, uh, suffered from mental illness and eventually uh, they got divorced. Um, Didn't you tell me that all. 
wives suffer from mental illness. Isn't that what you said before we, we were got on there? Wasn't uh, that you? No, that, 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 that must have been Jordan. That wasn't me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he, but, can't, he can't defend himself right now, so it's gotta be, it was him, I think. <laughs> we better watch what we're saying there for sure. <laughs> no, we do not think all wives suffer from mental illness. Um, could yeah. be the other way around, I'm sure. So, uh, but uh, yeah, so bad enough, he divorces his wife, um, which is an odd, you know, not a very common thing, you know, during that time. He ends up moving yeah. uh, Pleasureville there. It's at the, in the border of Henry County and Spencer County, not yeah. too very Frankfurt there. Uh, you mean Henry County is Shelby County? Yep, that's where he eventually moved uh, to. Uh, yeah, um, and that's, um, that's where he dies. At the yep. age of 74, which is you know, pretty good, long, long uh, life. Uh, he's buried in, uh, well, he, was he moved to the Frankfurt Cemetery? Yeah, he was, he was buried yeah. right there in 18, 1850. And uh, there in 1919, they exhumed him and uh, moved him to the current spot that I showed you there. Um, you know, that, that there, that's a circular around that monument right there. And on the other side, directly uh, uh, six o'clock from, from uh, Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon is... Uh, Vice President uh, Richard Johnson there, uh, over there, and, and there's several other prominent people that are buried around there. So he's given a, a spot of great importance um, right there, too. Hmm. Yeah. Um, three Navy ships have been named after him. But the most interesting thing, I mean, the, um, the office, officer's basic school in Quantico, Virginia, is named after him. That's how that Quantico. Quantico. Oh, that's the show, right? <laughs> yeah. so <laughs> Where do you think yeah. that comes from? <laughs> there you go. There you go. Makes sense now. <laughs> yeah, that's the uh, that's where the, the officer's basic training is there in Quantico. So, uh, mm -hmm. which I mean, it's just so surprising that that little is named after him. He seems like a very, I mean, important dude, especially the, the beginnings of the Marines. I mean. It has this big notable battle, uh, but there's just not a lot. Do you think it? I mean, do you think it's the O'Bannon part? I mean, was it, you think about it because he's Irish or, uh, or just it could be, you know, it could be a little bit of that. Uh, but you know, a lot of it I think was the fact that uh, this was a, a battle that was on foreign soil and mm -hmm. the Marines were so small and such to begin with, kind of thing. So yeah. Um, a lot of people don't realize the Marine Corps would only have been a few hundred people probably during this time, you know, the entire Marine Corps kind of thing. So yeah. even today, there's only, I think right now, the strength's about 150,000 in comparison to uh -huh. almost uh -huh. like 2.7 million in the Army when you consider the, the reserves uh -huh. and the National Guard and all that kind of thing. So um, the Marine Corps is a very, very small unit. That's why, like I said, we're a cult. So, uh, but, but uh, yeah, man, important guy and an and important Kentuckian for sure. And uh, yeah. definitely a Kentuckian yeah. that we should claim. Yeah, I would think that most Kentuckians are not going to know who he is and then not make the connection about how uh, important he was to the Marines and you know, the, uh, the battles he fought in. And, and even being a legislature and those, those uh, things as well. Whenever I first saw uh, Lieutenant uh O'Bannon, I thought it was a lieutenant governor. The first time I think I saw his name. Had no idea he had this much history. Uh, you know, so Yeah. Very much worth yeah. worth the discussion. Absolutely. Yeah, man. So um yeah, thanks for letting us talk about uh, him tonight and uh who we got next week. Oh oh slugger, maybe. Maybe. Maybe maybe uh maybe uh <laughs> Pete Browning, the Louisville Slugger. Where'd that word Louisville Slugger come from? We're going to find out next week. Louisville. Yeah, man, absolutely. So, well, I guess we'll uh, sign off for now. If you don't have anything else to say about Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon. I'm good, man. I got him in. So I know over time, since this is going to be on our YouTube channel, we're going to have lots and lots of Marines that are going to, you know, be looking for Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon and come across this video uh, for years and years to come. Just wanted to make sure I tell you guys, hey, Semper Fi, you know, carry on Marines. And uh, hey, remember, family tree nuts, let our nuts find the nuts in your family tree. 
At Family Tree Nuts, we make professional, historic videos all over the country and currently have videos in 25 states and even a few international. Let's face it, nobody wants to read anymore. As a matter of fact, nobody wants to even watch long videos, which is why I'm going to keep this real quick. Moving into the future, how are we going to educate the public on all the historic treasures that are found in every community? We have found the answer. Short, entertaining, and to the point videos with lots of shots and views that are relevant to the subject. These videos are shared on social media and are the fastest and least expensive way to educate the community on the history of your area. We have experience working with historical organizations as well as city or county tourism departments and chamber of commerces to produce these videos for their use. Our clients are provided with copies of any video produced as well as online links to the videos that they can easily add to their websites. Let us document and produce videos of just a few or all the historic sites in your area. You will find our rates extremely affordable and well below the industry standard for media production. We are passionate about preserving and documenting as many historical sites as we can, and we would love to work with you. For more information, contact me directly at russ at familytreenuts.org or my personal phone at 859-314-1976. And remember, Family Tree Nuts, let our nuts find the nuts in your family tree.